Hello everyone, well today we're going to talk about outliers. What are they exactly and how can they affect our models? Well, for understanding the matter a little bit better, I decided to give you an example of an experiment that I did on myself. But before we get into that, let me just tell you that everything that I'm going to be talking about in this video is going to be in the Kaggle kernel that I'll be linking in the description below and also all the references and code and everything that you will be needing for getting a little bit more information on this subject. Also, if you want to see more of this content, please make sure to subscribe to this channel or follow me on Kaggle. But enough of these introductions, let's get to the point. So after a few months into the quarantine, I started feeling less motivated and really tired and exhausted of being at home all day long. So what I did was that I thought, you know, I have to keep myself motivated to get to what I'm actually doing. I had to work, I had to study and so many other things and really didn't want to binge watch, for example, Big Bang Theory from morning that I wake up to the night that I go to sleep. So what I did was that I started an experiment on myself. I wanted to see what is it that makes me happy and also motivated and lifts my mood so I can actually work and be more productive. The thing that you're seeing on the screen is actually a part of the experiment that I did. Uh, as you can see, I recorded each day what activities I did. For example, did I work out? Did I meditate? Did I draw? Or other things like going out for a walk or whatever. But these are actually on paper, so I had to just like enter them, a few of them, into the Excel spreadsheet so I can plot them easily and show you the result. When you look at this graph, you see that my overall mood is around 50 or 60. But as you can see, there are some very big jumps or spikes, as well as some very small ones. And I thought, how can I actually predict my own mood in next week? Can I use all this data without changing anything? Well, for making a predictive model, we first have to understand the data, right? And what are these spikes representing, actually? Do I have a big spike that is representing that my mood goes up to 100 every week. So after checking all the points, I found out that this big spike is actually my birthday. And apparently, having a big chocolate cake in the fridge makes me 100% happy. Well, you know, here is the problem. Not every day is my birthday. And in fact, in terms of monthly levels of happiness, there's only one month in which I'm going to be this happy. So it's pretty rare, also far away from other examples. So in formal definitions, we call this a point outlier, and it is something we actually get rid of to prevent it from degrading our model's performance. Okay, so let's go and check out other high points. Well, there are actually some points that deviate from the normal line, but are not so far away from them. Well, when I looked at my recordings and activities, I saw that these are the days that I, for example, went out for a run, then did a lot of vigorous workout and could see my friends, went on the mountains and went climbing and so on. And in general, did something that was very different from my normal routine. Well, these days and points are called contextual outliers, these that depend on other features to exist. And in real world, you can see them in... Business, when a high volume of sale occur due to some promotions or special occasions, like discounts that we give our customers each and every week or month. Or even in natural language processing, when we have symbols or punctuations among different letters or words. Okay, so till now we identified two different types of outliers, and I could say why I was really happy in those days. Uh, but there are some days that I don't really know what is actually happening, like in this point or in this one. I have a little better mood than usual, but there's nothing spectacular about these days. Or more precisely, I can't see anything spectacular about them. And these points are in fact the ones that show me some new things about myself. Maybe in this day, I talked more with my family and had a very good relationship with them. Maybe I was making a YouTube video and just having fun with it. And so many other possibilities. These points are what we call collective outliers. They show us some novelties in our data. And in fact, in the real world, it helps astrophysicists discover a new planet, help physicists find out about a new particle, just like how they could find out about Higgs boson. And in fact, 
the evidence that it existed was the byproduct of two beams of particles colliding into each other. It was actually noise in the data, but they didn't stop there. They said maybe this actually means something. So now we're going to apply some methods on a real data set and see the results. Well, the first method is just manually plotting the data and intuitively or even logically selecting some points that we think are definitely meaningless or are just degrading our model. Well, in the Boston House Price dataset, we can see that the author in the description says explicitly that he thinks around four points are outliers and we can plot and see them by plotting the sales price against the ground living area or the size of the houses. These points are either partial or simply abnormal sales. And you can see the data is much less spread and is also in a very smaller range after the removal of these points. Well, this wasn't a very scientific method, but hopefully there are measurements and tools like variance, mean, box plots, and so many other things that can actually come to our help. So firstly, let's plot the distribution of sale price. What do you see in it? Isn't it a little bit skewed? Well, for using our data variance as a method to detect outliers, we have to have some specific criteria. Our data has to be Gaussian or at least Gaussian-like, or in other words, as you may say, normally distributed. Well, think about it. Why do we say such a thing? Well, because if we don't have a symmetrical bell-shaped figure, you can't detect anomalies well on both sides. The skewed side is so stretched out and also extreme that we cannot actually pay enough attention to the other side. Well, then what should we do in here? We should simply transform our data. You can read about different transformation methods and their functionality on my Kaggle kernel, but right now we want to see the results and see how it's helped us. Well, after taking a Boxcox transformation of our data, we can reach something like this. Now our data is Gaussian-like, and we can confidently say that we will be detecting the ones that are really outliers. And right now, what we do is we start dividing our data with a method called Six Sigma. And what we mean by this term is that around 99.7% of our data is actually within three sigmas after and three sigmas before the mean. So right now, we can say whatever point deviates more than three sigmas from the mean is an anomaly. And just a quick note here, we can also determine the small parts that are left out with something called p-value. We say that these observations that are less probable than this p-value are very rare and unlike to happen. So we don't really think they have to do anything with our data. Okay, so the last method we talked about was scientific, right? But sometimes in the real world especially, we don't want to spend hours trying to figure these points out. We want an automatic procedure. So first we'll look at a very interesting method called the minimum covariance determination. Well, what is it exactly? Remember how we plotted the sale price values and said which ones fall out of the normal range? Well, we're doing the same thing here, but with multiple features. This time, the range becomes something like a circle or in high dimensional space, an ellipsoid. In this 3D graph, you see that three normal distributions are actually plotted against each other, and there are actually some points that fall out of this ellipsoid shape. And these are the ones that we assign minus one to and say that are anomalies. You can actually read its code on Kaggle, and maybe the name is a little bit of a mouthful, but it's very straightforward and easy to implement. Well, there are two other methods that I want to quickly mention. One is local outlier factor. This method is very much like the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, but in fact in here, what we're really interested in is the density of different areas in our data set. So what we do is simply calculate the density around each point and then compare it with k points around that specific example. And then after comparing these scores, we can see which ones are the ones that are isolated, the ones that are far away and can be our outliers or the anomalies. 
Well, the last method is called isolation forest. In this method, what we do is that we start by making trees and then calculating the average length of the path, we go until we get to the node or end of the tree. And this is actually calculated for every and each example. Then because the anomalies have very distinctive features, it's not really hard to distinguish them from other ones. So in here, in the examples that are different and are anomalies, we will have a shorter path. So these were the examples that I wanted to show you as different methods of detecting anomalies. But here, what is really important at the end is to compare these methods and see which ones work the best. So for that, we can actually use something called cross-validation that I'm sure so many of you are familiar with. Firstly, we choose a model or even a simple model, something like ridge regression, and then we start dropping different groups of outliers detected by different methods. And then we use cross-validation and see which ones give us the highest R2 score or the lowest error. Thank you for watching this video with me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And yeah, just try to be safe and stay alive during quarantine. And yeah, that's it. Bye.